Today's stuff we're going to be learning is Ketubo Taf Um I'm excited to announce that I'll be speaking in Denver this evening, so I'll be teaching actually tomorrow's stuff. And thank you in advance to the Andorskis who will be hosting the Shi'ur, and also to the Fishmans who will be hosting um, a Shi'ur I'll be giving on Shabbat afternoon in Denver. And uh, if you're around, so come listen. It's all sponsored by the Denver Kihila. Um, my husband will be speaking there also over the weekend, so we're really looking forward to a nice weekend. So thank you to our hosts. Um, and thank you to the Fishman and the Andorskis in advance. Okay, and for those who are coming, just a reminder, the shear will be, the, I'll be teaching tomorrow's daf, uh, Friday's daf. Okay. Um, today's daf is sponsored by the Maybaum, Ray, and Cohen families in loving memory of Miriam Mim Cohen, Miriam Bat Michael on her shloshim, our kind-hearted, fun-loving, and totally unique big sister, Devoted wife and mother, ardent Zionist, and proud Jew, we miss you. Okay, we're going to get started um, on our dot at the bottom of Lamed Hamabet. We saw a brayta, started with a brayta that talked about arayot, ushniot larayot, have no knas, and not pitu. Okay, there's a few cases in this brayta, we're going to go one by one, so I'll just review the first case. So if a man rapes a woman who was forbidden to him for one of the forbidden relationships. Here it just sounds like any forbidden relationship, and even a rabbinic one, that's usually shniot la rayot, doesn't pay the knas. To which the Gemara asks, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. So starting from two lines from the bottom of Alam and Ham a bit, my arayot, umay shniot la rayot, ilema arayot, arayot mamash, and shniot are midivrei sofrim. If you're going to say that arayot means what I just said, any forbidden arayot from the Torah. And shniot is any rabbinic ones. Wait, the whole reason why you don't pay knas is because of the law of kimle. Kimle doesn't work if you did something that's rabbinic on a Torah level. You're not obligated anything. It's only rabbinic. And then you're obligated by Torah law, knas. You can't have something that's rabbinic override the payment of knas. That makes no sense. Ela arayot must be chayve mitopitin. And shniot is chayve krito. We're going to have two possible answers. The first one is to say that arayot is chayve mitopetin, once that you get penalty by the hands of the court. And shniot means, not shniot normally what we mean, secondary meaning they're only chayv karit. Okay. The karit is less serious, but yes, we saw there was a bit of a difference between them. You don't, won't get death in this, right, in this world, you know, by the hands of man. So shniot is chayve krito. And then, now what's excluded? If it's a lotase like mamzer, right, or some sort of arayot that's only a lotase, right, all the different forbidden relations like almana uh, lekoin gadol and those kind, well, yesh them knas. Then if somebody, you know, there was a rape case like that, you would pay knas. Umanu, and then who would this be? Ah, the bright is written by Rabbi Shimon Atimnihi, right? Obviously the bright doesn't go with our Mishnah, because our Mishnah listed all these arayot that you do pay knas. So, right, and those are the ones correct. So, this would be Shimon Atimni, if you remember, there were three opinions. There was our Mishnah, which says, only Chayve Mito Beitin, Kim Lake kicks in, right? We saw Rabbi Shimon Atimni, who said, the Knaz payment is only, because it says, below Elisha, she will marry, right? He has to marry her. It's only in a case where the marriage will be valid. And is, if there's Mito Beitin, if there's Kritut, there's no valid marriage. If you create a marriage, right? You do a marriage, a harayat mekudesh ali, with someone who you're not allowed to of, it's either going to be karet or mita beitin, or death by the hands of the court. It's not a marriage at all, right? For example, you don't need a divorce. You're not even married. Whereas chayve lavim kidushin or tofsin. You might not be allowed to be married to them, but it is a valid marriage. So that's Rabbi Shimon Atimni who draws the line there. Well, the next option is to say, that Arayot includes both mitobetin and Kritut. So what's Shniot then? Shniot chayve lavim. And then it's coming to say, even chayve lavim, you don't pick nas. Who does that match? That's the third opinion. Mani Rabbi Shimon ben Menasihi, who said, Vilot Yelisha is kolara oila kaima. Any woman, who, if you rape a woman, who you're allowed to stay married to. Now, if it's Kohen and a Grusha, for example, a divorcee, you're not allowed to stay married. That's a lotase, but you can't stay married. Or a mamzir, you're not allowed to marry, you can't stay married to them if you did. So he thinks all of those are excluded from knas. So this brighter could theoretically be, according to him, 
or according to Rabbi Sh- uh, Shimon Atimni. Okay, next line of the Brayta. Mima'enet ela lo knas velo pitoy. Okay, again, what's a mima'enet? If the father is, the father mar- can marry off a young woman, and right, or his, his daughter when she's a ketana or a na'ara, and the, valid, the marriage is valid on a Torah level. But if the father's not around, or not alive, and can't, or can't marry her off, the mother or the brother could do it, but it only has validity on a rabbinic level, which means because of that, we allow her to just say, I'm not interested in this man at some point when she gets older. She can say, I'm not interested in this man, and get out of the marriage immediately, without a get, without anything. This is only until a certain age. We're going to assume right now it's until, right, normally it's 12 years, and two sarot, okay? It means she has simanim bagrut. So now, if that's the case, it says here, Mama Enet en la lo knas velo pitoy. Now, what did we say before? The Rabbi Meir and the rabbis disagree about what's the age in which a woman gets knas. According to Rabbi Meir, it's only that six month period when she's a nara. If she's younger than that, the father doesn't get knas for her. Or older than that also. According to the rabbis, even a ketana, you have to pay knas if you rape a ketana. So, Mima'enet en la lo knas velo pitoy, a Mima'enet is a woman who was married to someone by her mother or brother, decided to get out of it, and presumably, right, when she does that, she's still a ketana, because she can't do it if she's older, right? So this seems to imply, and the point here is, she's not going to get knas, even though she normally would have, which is the, 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 the inference of the Gemara. Ha ketana ba'al me'itle. If a Mima'enet is a young girl, she's not yet an ara. That means that her counterpart is a woman, a young girl, who hasn't done miyun yet, right? Meaning, if you did miyun, you're now precluded from getting the knas because we assume that you were married to this man and then you must have had relations with him, you're not a virgin anymore. But if you, were, you didn't do miyun, meaning, let's say you weren't even married off by your mother or your brother, then we assume that what? Then you get knas. But... Someone who does miyun is a ketana, she's a minor. And Rabbi Meir said that a minor doesn't, get, doesn't ever get knas. So the inference from this is that, again, you have the mima enet, who's a, who's a minor, she's in the stage of a ketana. And her parallel, right, she doesn't get knas, but someone parallel to her who didn't go through this process of miyun and didn't get married off by her mother or brother, she would get knas. But that doesn't match Rabbi Meir, which is kind of okay, but we're going to see. My Rabbanan, he so this must be Rabbanan, da Amrik, Tanayesh la Knas. However, that's not going to work because of the next line. Ema Seifa, continuation of the Brayta says, Ailonit en la lo Knas velo Pitoy. And Ailonit doesn't have Knas and doesn't have Pitoy. Now, why does an Ailonit not get a Knas? Because an Ailonit is a woman who doesn't ever have Simanim, that she's getting older, right? She, she basically never develops. At age, basically, she never has a stage of na'arut. Na'arut is only a stage where she has, she gets reaches the age of 12, and she has two pubic hairs. That Ailonit never has that. So she skips the stage of na'arut, and she goes straight to bagrut. When she gets to age 20, we just assume we call her a bogeret. Okay? Even though, right, she doesn't have any simanim. According to, now, so why does an Ailonit not have knas and not have pitoy? That must be Atala Rabbi Meir, Da Mark Tana and La Knas. Because an Ailoni either is a Ktana or she's a Bogaret. And a Bogaret for sure doesn't get Knas, and a Ktana doesn't get Knas according to Rabbi Meir. Bahami Katnuta Yatstala Beger. As soon as she finished Ktanut, she went straight to Beger, she skipped the stage of Nara, and that's why she doesn't get Knas. So we now have a problem. Resha Rabbanam is safe for Rabbi Meir. The Mimeanit assumes that we're talking about a, a minor, which is Rabbi Rabbanan's opinion. And the Seifa, which says an island who doesn't have knas, would have to be Rabbi Meir, because the rabbis would say, of course an island who can get knas, she's a ketana. So, how do we explain this? We're going to have four attempts. The first one the Gemara already knows from the beginning is going to fail, and we'll see that a bunch of the other ones fail as well. But this one starts off as a failed attempt, because it starts off a chitema, and if you want to say, which always ends up with a rejection, if you want to say, kula Rabbi Meir hi, ube enet savalaki Rabbi Yehuda, Maybe we hold it's all Rabbi Meir. The Mima'enet part also. How could you explain that? Well, maybe he holds like Rabbi Yehuda, who actually thinks that a girl could do Mi'un at a later age, even during the time of Na'arut. We're going to see that in a minute. But before we even see that, we're going to say, no way, no how, can we say that Rabbi Meir holds like Rabbi Yehuda and the Mima'enet? 
Could he possibly hold that way? No way. It says in a bright Ad mataya bat mamaenet, until what stage can a do- girl do miyun? Ad shtavish she sa'arot, until she has two pubic hairs, devre Rabbi Meir. Rabbi Meir explicitly says, I hold until the age of na'arut, not including na'arut. So we can't possibly hold like Rabbi Yehuda, who we're going to see right now. Rabbi Yehuda omer, ad shire shachor yirbe shachor ala lavan. Only once it's more black than white, what does this mean? It's talking about the area where she has pubic hairs growing. When she has two sarot, it's more white, more of her skin than the hairs. Once the hairs now, there's two interpretations, either they just grow very long, that they cover most of the space, or that more hairs grow in their place and it's more dense, and then it looks more black than white. According to Rabbi Yehuda, the stage of na'arut, you could still do miyun, but Rabbi Meir can't possibly hold like Rabbi Yehuda, so you can't possibly explain the whole thing like Rabbi Meir. So, option number two. And the Rabbi Yehuda Maybe the whole bright is Rabbi Yehuda. Ubik tana savalaka Rabbi Meir. Just like we tried to say, maybe Rabbi Meir holds like the, on the Mion issue, like Rabbi Yehuda. Now we'll say the reverse. Maybe Rabbi Yehuda holds like Rabbi Meir on the age issue for, for uh, Knas, which would help us with the Iloni case. And we can say, when it comes to Mion, that works very well because Rabbi Yehuda holds that she could be a na'ara, in which case it's basically saying a na'ara normally has knas, but the one, the woman, the girl who does miyun doesn't have knas. But because again, because she's presumed not to be a virgin. And when it comes to the ilonit, he must say, oh, ilonit and knas, because he holds like Rabbi Meir on that issue, right? There's two different issues here. So the problem is going to be only savala, but wait, we're going to see from elsewhere that Rabbi Yuda doesn't hold like Rabbi Meir. Now, it's not going to be as clear a proof, but Rabbi Yudah Marav said on the Mishnah Amem Amubet. Okay, this Mishnah Amem Amubet, which we saw already this opinion and quoted in a Brayta, but it's Rabbi Meir's opinion. The Mishnah is exclusively Rabbi Meir's opinion about the age, which is what we're trying to say. Maybe Rabbi Yudah holds like this: You can sell your daughter to be a slave. That's the age we're going to assume when she's a ktana. Then ain't knas. Then you don't get knas. The koma kom sheesh knas. And when you do pay the knas, because that's nara and mecher, that's not an age the father could sell the daughter. Ketana, and now we're going to say it explicitly. Ketana, a minor, yesh la mecher ve'en la knas. But nara, yesh la knas ve'en la mecher. And the bogeret doesn't get either. Okay. Anyway, that's the Mishnah. That Mishnah is clearly Rabbi Meir. Now what does it say? Rabbi Yehuda said the name of Rav, Zo divrei Rabbi Meir. That Mishnah is Rabbi Meir. Now, how do we know that Rabbi Yehuda doesn't hold that way? Because in Eitai, if Rabbi Yehuda held like Rabbi Meir on that issue, it would, Rabbi Yehuda would have said in the name of Rav, Zo divrei Rabbi Meir, ve Rabbi Yehuda mebaile. It should have said, this is Rabbi Yehuda and Rabbi Meir, or Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Yehuda. So the fact that he doesn't mention Rabbi Yehuda means Rabbi Yehuda probably doesn't hold that way. In which case, we're back to square one. Again, we have no way to reconcile these two lines in the Brayta, because one seems to hold like Rabbanan, about the issue of, or Rabbi Yehuda, I would say, about the issue of Miun, that Miun is past, right, is during the stage of Na'arut. And the other issue seems to like Rabbi Meir that a Ktana doesn't get Knas ever. That's the Ailoni. So, third answer. Hai Tana, Savalaka Rabbi Meir, Bachadu, Palagale Bachada. We can say it's, a, it's a, a different Tana, not Rabbi Meir, not Rabbi Huda. It's some other Tana that came after, probably, and held like Rabbi Meir when it came to the Ktana issue, the Ktana and la Knas. But when it came to the Miyun issue, held disagreed with Rabbi Meir and held that you can even do Miyun when you're a Nala, you're older. So that's possibility three, and that one is really a good possibility. Raf from Amar, he says, I disagree with the whole premise of this question. We assumed the Mima Enet and Laknas, but if it was a counterpart and it was a Nala, right, it would have, and, or a Ktana, which was the problem, because a Ktana never has Knas, according to Rabbi Meir. So what does he say? Right? And then uh, the whole thing is Rabbi Meir. What do we say? It doesn't mean Mema'enet. It means anyone who could theoretically do Miyun according to Rabbi Meir. And when is that? When they're a Ketana. And basically what he wants to say, in other words, is any Ketana, not just one who does Miyun, any Ketana can get, doesn't get Knas because she's a Ketana. Ketanok don't get Knas. To which the Gemara says, well, that sounds very nice, but 
If he wanted to say ketana, doesn't get knas, he should have just simply said ketana. He shouldn't call her hamimaenet. Mimaenet sounds like one who particularly did miu, not just one who's only a ketana. To which the Gemara says, you're right, kasha. This is, in fact, a difficulty. Okay, so we have four potential answers, and three of them, in fact, were at least possibility, right, two of them were really rejected, and the fourth one was just saying, well, it doesn't sound like a good possibility. Okay, now we'll go to the Iloni. Iloni and lo knas for lo pito. So an Iloni, we already saw in the Brighton, doesn't have knas, doesn't have pito. Urimini. But wait, this contradicts another Brighton. Hachereshet vashota. We've talked about the deaf. She doesn't hear and she doesn't speak. She's considered someone who doesn't have knowledge. Again, we've talked about this many times, that if you're new to the Masecha, maybe you're new to Ketubo, you haven't heard this, so I'll re- review. Generally, we talk that today things might be very different nowadays, but in those days, they pres- assumed someone can't speak and can't hear, it didn't have knowledge. Shota, also not one of, one of, sound, not one of sound mind, okay, which could be you know, mental disabilities or, or you know, um, not like bouts of insanity. Anyway, chereshet or shota v'ha'ilonit yesh lahem knas. Okay, number one, they have knas, number, which goes against what we just saw. Number two, yesh lahem tanat betulim. If somebody claims against them, you, you know, when I got married, I thought you were a betula, you were a virgin, and I gave you a, a 200 sous, and now it turns out you're not, I want my money back. Right, so he can claim that. So the Gemara says, I don't even know why you're asking, this is a contradiction. Hi, my rumia. It's true, one said yes, and one said no, but we already just saw there's a machloket about this. Ha Rabbi Meir, ha Rabbi Nam. We can easily say the Mishnah that says she doesn't get knas is Rabbi Meir. The, I'm sorry, the Braita. The Braita that says she does get knas is the rabbis who say even ketanot get knas. And an ailonit is a ketanan, she should get knas. And right now they're only focusing on the ailonit part. So the Gemara, right, that's a pretty good answer to which the extent that the Gemara said, Ude karele, my karele. So what were they even thinking when they asked this question in the first place? To which they answer, Mishum They really brought the Brayta not because of the first Brayta. The second Brayta was brought because of a contradiction between it and a third Brayta. And now we're going to leave the Iloni and focus on the Chereshet and the Shota. So the third Brayta says, HaChereshet Shota, the two we saw before, and two others, a Bogeret, a woman who's beyond 12 and 6 months, and a mukat eitz, one who had an injury, right, that because of that she tore her hymen, ain lahem ta'anat betulim. They can't claim ta'anat betulim. Hasuma v'ha'ailonit, but the suma and the ailonit, here comes in the ailonit, yesh lahem ta'anat betulim. Okay, this is, by the way, not talking anymore about kanaf. Okay, but you can claim that, okay, so the, the chereshet shota bogeret mukat eitz, you can't claim, oh, I thought you were a virgin. Okay? You can't assume they were necessarily virgins and were lying to you maybe if they didn't, right? But if she's blind or she's an Iloni, then you can claim Betulim. Sumchus Omer Mishum Rabbi Meir, on this last halacha, Sumchus says in the name of Rabbi Meir, Suma Ein Latana Betulim, a blind woman who gets married, the husband can't claim, I thought you were a virgin, when it turns out he finds out she's not, he doesn't have a claim. So we're going to have to understand all these different parts as we go on, so be patient. First thing they're going to deal with is the contradiction of the Chereshet and Shota, who in one source it says they have Tana Betulim, someone can make a claim against them. And the second one who says, no, they don't have any claim. Okay, the women are protected from any kind of Betulim claim. Oh, you aren't a virgin. So to which the Gemara answers, Amar of Sheshet, Lo Kashya. Not a difficulty. Ha Rabbanan, Ha Rabbi Yeshua. Okay, way back to earlier in the Masechet, there were a lot of cases where we saw they disagreed. If you remember, when it comes to Tanah Petulim, if a woman says, Misha ne'erasti, ne'anasti, right? I was raped, it's true I don't have Betulim, but I was raped after we were already betrothed, so you have no claim on me. When we were betrothed, I really was a virgin. Since she can claim that, okay, comes Rabban Gamliel and he'll say, in our case, the Chereshet and the Shota, they can't make a claim themselves, so the court will claim that for them. Okay, basically a fascinating case, and we're going to talk about it a little more within the next few lines of the Gemara. Basically, these women are helpless. They can't make their own claims. So the court is going to make a claim for them. Since if they were of sound mind, you know, and they had knowledge, they'd be able to make a claim and claim, well, now it's a little bit weird, you might say, because what do you mean they could make a claim? Only if that was actually the truth. Okay, so it's a little bit of an interesting thing here. But the point is, they can't claim for themselves. The court's going to claim for them. And Harabi Yeshua and the Brayta that says they have a Tanah that the husband can come up against them, 
That's Rabbi Yeshua who says we don't believe the woman even if she says Mishineres Taninas Nanasti. I thought I was raped after the engagement. We don't believe her anyway. So of course we're not going to believe these women, right? There's no reason. So to which the Gemara says, wait a minute. That's only if she comes forward with that claim. The whole reason she's believed is, if you remember, was because of Amigo, because she could have said, I'm a Mukat Eitz, and that's why I had a, uh, uh, it was an injury, it had nothing to do with her, sexual relations, and therefore we're going to believe her. Well, but here, she doesn't she make her own claim, so we're going to go make a claim for her? What kind of craziness is this? To which the Gemara answers a fascinating line in Kevan de Amar Rabban Gamliel Mehemna, since a regular woman would be believed, Kigon Zo Ptach Picha Li'ilemu. This is a case where we would say, open the mouth for those who can't speak. This is a great line, basically saying you have to take care of people who are in, who are in need. People who can't make their own claims, we have to make claims for them. We don't even know, it's fascinating, because we don't even know if she was raped once the engagement happened. But we can assume that since she couldn't have a claim, she can't make a claim herself, we have to make any claim we can for her, and therefore she, no one can go claim Betulim against her. It's a real way of protecting these women. Next case. Habogeret en Latana Betulim. So now we're already in Brighton number three, and we want to understand more of the cases in Brighton number three. So this Bogeret has no Tana Betulim. Wait a minute, why not? Amarav, the Hamarav, didn't Rav say, Bogeret no Tzim Laila Harishon. What is this talking about? And nowadays, after the first night, right, the husband and wife go together, they have relations, they immediately have to separate because of the dam betulim, because of the blood from her hymen tearing. Now, that is what we call dam makah. That's not dam nida. They shouldn't really need to separate. The rabbis were strict. At a certain point, they decided we're going to make dam betulim treated kind of like dam nida, and they have to separate. But before those days, which the days of Rav was before that was instituted, Dam betulim was treated as a as a as a an injury. It's not blood that's uterine blood that's going to make a woman impure to her husband, and they have to separate. So therefore, he says, if if a woman sees blood on the first night, if she's a, first of all if she's not a virgin, then if she sees blood the first night, we have to assume it's dam and they have to separate. So comes Rav and he says a bogeret, if she's older but still a virgin, not la la harishon. She gets the whole first night, any kind of blood she sees, we assume that first night, let's say they had sex a number of times, that first night, any blood she sees is going to be considered dam betulim. Okay, now, what does that seem to imply? That a bogeret is still a virgin, which means that why not say yesh latana betulim? If there is no blood, then the husband can come claim, claim, hey, there was no blood, you're not a virgin. Moving now to Amabet, to which the Gemara answers, and you might remember we made this distinction in the beginning of the Masachet, If the husband comes forward and says, I know for a fact there was no blood, because he checked right away, and saw no blood anywhere, then we believe him. However, and in what case is a Bulgarian different from a younger girl? If he claims, if you remember, if a man didn't notice whether there was blood or not, so he has nothing to say about the blood because he doesn't have proof of it, but he does know, you know how he knows this was a good question, but he knows that it wasn't very tight, the area where they were having relations. He could tell that it was stretched. Then we're going to say, if that's the case, that is a claim that does not hold any water to a Bulgarian. Because the assumption is once the, girl, the woman is grown up and is already past the age of Na'arut, it's already the area is no longer as narrow as it was, and a Petach Petuach claim is not accepted. Now we're going to try to understand Sumchus, who said, Suma en Latana Petulim. So why? My time it's Sumchus, just because she's blind, she still has da'at, she has knowledge, she, she can make claims. So what's the difference here? Why he says uh, someone can't come claim against her that she wasn't a virgin. She falls a lot. Now we assume right now why does she fall a lot? Because she's blind, she doesn't see things, she falls a lot. What does it mean she falls a lot? Well, if she falls a lot, she might have torn her hymen. To which the Gemara said, fascinating, interesting line, I think. All girls are clumsy. They all fall a lot. I don't know why they think all girls fall, but it's very common for a girl to fall. Maybe the point is, there's, it's very easy to tear your hymen by having some sort of accident. 
So they say, no, there's a difference because kulu ro'ot umarot iman. All those women who are not blind can see. So if they tear their hymen, they'll see blood and they'll know that they were bleeding. And they'll tell their mothers. Why is that relevant? You'll see in a minute. But zo, ena ro'a ve'ena maral iman. But this woman who's blind didn't see. So she might have fallen a number of times, but she has no idea that she tore her hymen. And then she doesn't tell her mother. So when her parents marry her off, they have no idea that she's not a virgin. So there was no false play here. The whole idea of this betulim is that I was duped into something. You know, you told me you were a virgin and you're not. So if she were to fall and would know she had bled and had told her mother, we assume she told her mother, then her mother should have known when they arranged the marriage, they should have been honest about it. But if the mother didn't even know, and not only that, but she didn't even know, then nobody was trying to fake anyone out here and therefore you can't claim I was duped by the family. Next case. Now we're going back to the first Brita. Okay, we've now explained all the cases in that third Brita where we had the contradiction, we resolved the contradiction, and then went into explaining the different cases. Now we're going back to the first Brita. Yosei Mishum Shemra, in a loknas for lo pitu. So a Yosei Mishum Shemra, the Gemara says, wait a minute. A Yosei Mishum Shemra, bat skilahi. What's the problem here? This woman is deserving of skila because Forget about getting knas. Okay, now here it's a little bit tricky. Just want to check one thing here because there's an assumption here, right? She. The assumption is that the rape that happened. One second, let me just double check one thing before I say this. Make sure that I'm right about this. Um, uh, ba -ba. Right, so the assumption here is that she is, um, she's chayevet skila. Okay, what does it mean that you're saying shum shemra? It means shemra is when witnesses come and say you were with some other man while you were engaged. So she's for sure, there's proof that she was with some other man, in which case, for sure, the bride doesn't need to say that she doesn't get knas. Of course she doesn't get knas. She was a, she was a bit, a bit ula, right? So for sure, that's not an issue. So if somebody rapes a woman who's Yotzei Mishum Shemra, of course she has relations. So that's not a question. So, and, as, and then you don't need the bride to tell you that. It's obvious. Amar of Sheshet Hachi Kama. Sheshet means this is what it means. Mi sheyatsa ala Hashem Rabi Yalduta, ena lo knas velo pitoy. A woman who there were rumors going around about her, that she slept around. A woman like that doesn't, if she's raped by someone, she doesn't get knas, she doesn't get pitoy, because again, there's an assumption that she's a bit ula, that she's already not a virgin. And again, remember, it says in Psukim, she has to be a virgin, right? The Psukim of the rape and the payment are all about a woman who's a virgin. Amara Papa, Shmamina, you can infer from here. Hai shdara rea, lo magbinambe. Papa says you can infer from here that a shtar rea, that if there's a shtar where there's suspicion of Right, there people think that this guy forges documents. He can't collect. A person who's under suspicion that he forges documents can't collect his shah. To which the Gemara, so we have two things here. We have Rav Sheshit saying it about a woman who's suspected of having slept around, isn't believed. And Rav Papa applies that to a person who has a document who's suspicious of having forged documents. He's not believed either. So it's the same thing, basically. He's saying you can derive it from here. So hey, Chindami, what's the case? If you're going to say there's rumor that this document was a forged document, which the comparison to our case would be, again, like we thought before, that there's rumor that she was that she was slept around. But Rav already told us, People, and now this is a totally different topic, but it has to do with the same thing. A Kohen can't marry a Zona. But if there's rumors that this woman slept around, we don't worry about those rumors. We allow a Kohen to marry her. We don't, we don't believe rumors. So if that's the case, we shouldn't believe rumors in either of these cases. So that doesn't make any sense. It must be with the woman that two witnesses came and said, she tried to seduce us, okay? This woman tried to bring us into her bed to have relations with her. We didn't, you know, we stood up to the, you know, to her. We, we didn't do anything, but she seduced us, tried to seduce us. And then you can assume that she probably seduced other men and they slept with her. Now, what's the comparison by documentation? 
דקווה תהכה. תעתו בית חי ואמר לדיתו אמר לו זייפו לי. Two people came and said, listen, this guy who's now pulling out this star, he tried to get us to falsely sign a document of his, which means now we're going to suspect that the document, that the people who did it, we didn't sign, but he obviously was looking for people to sign falsely, which means he's suspicious that this guy gets people to sign documents falsely. To which the Gemara said, wait a minute, those aren't really the same. This is an interesting comparison. Bishlam ahatam shrichei prutzim. Men, it's always easy to find men who want to sleep around with women. Their desires are strong. And therefore, if the woman's looking around for a man to sleep with, she probably found someone, in which case we can assume she's not a virgin. But Just because this guy's trying to find false witnesses, who's to say he's going to find people who are willing to sign on his document? First of all, false witnesses is less, you know, I mean, maybe he's offering the money. Maybe that's a big, you know, draw. But it's harder, right? There's no, they don't get any self-benefit out of it like, by having sexual relations with this woman. So, again, one could argue, maybe it's the same, maybe it's different, it's a good question. But they want to differentiate and say it's not so true. To which, right, it's not a fair comparison, in which case Rav Papa can't necessarily infer what he inferred from Rav Sheshit. To which the Gemara said, Hachanami, kevanda kamahadar aziyufa, em aziyufa zayef bekatav. If he was really trying to find sign- people who were willing to forge, if he couldn't find, he might have just forged the signatures himself. So therefore, he's really not believed, just like the woman is not believed as well. Okay, new Mishnah. We're finally getting to the next Mishnah, which talks about the women who don't have knas. Elu she'en lahem knas. Habal, and here it's going to be the comparison to the previous Mishnah. Habal a giyoret, v'ala shfuya v'ala shifcha, convert, a woman who was redeemed, or a slave, a maid servant. Shenif duva, shenif gairu, shenif shachru, right, that were redeemed, or converted, or freed. Okay, right, the order's a little off as it was in the previous one as well, right? It should be Nidgairu, Nifdu, or Nishtachuru. Yiterot Abanot Shalosh Shanim V'yom Echad. This time, this all happened, that they converted or got free, became Jewish, whatever it might be, after the age of three. And then there's suspicion that if they were raped, right, the rape would be considered legitimate rape, in which case they can't right now. What's the issue here? They won't get knas in our case because we assume they're not virgins. Again, Big question, right? Is this fair to assume? That's a whole separate question. But right now, the, you have to take what the Gemara says. That's the assumption. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, Okay? Rabbi Yehuda says, a woman who was redeemed, we don't hold in the same category as a Giyoret or a Shibcha. Okay? They were not Jewish at the time, and therefore there's suspicion. But when it comes to the Shvuya, we assume maybe she protected herself. Maybe, right, she, she prevented herself from getting raped. Or, or there's just not a high likelihood that she was raped. So, even if she's older, right? She's, even if she's over 12. Habal Bito, the next case is in the Mishnah where you don't get knas. These are all the cases where we saw Mito Beitin, right? Someone who sleeps with his daughter, al Bito, his, his granddaughter, al Beno, right? His granddaughter through his son or his daughter. al Ishto, his wife's daughter, al Bena, and her son's daughter, and al Bito, and her daughter's daughter. All those arayot are liable by the death penalty. So therefore, the court imposes the death penalty. This is the famous kimle that we've been talking about. Anyone who's liable for death penalty doesn't pay money. Here, interestingly, they're bringing a pasuk, even though we know this other pasuk, and we'll get to that later. Im lo yason, if the child isn't killed, right, the, the fetus, so it's the two men are fighting, and the woman gets in the middle, a pregnant woman, they kill her baby, so they pay money. Im lo yason anoshe anish. But if she gets killed, then there's no monetary payment because she, right, because they're liable, the death penalty for killing her. So now we're going to have two interpretations of Rabbi Yehuda, and then we're going to have questions on each of them. Amar Rabbi Yochana. Rabbi Yehuda and Rabbi Dosa Mudabarcha. Rabbi Yehuda and Rabbi Dosa both hold the same thing. Rabbi Yudah Adamaran, the Shvuya, right, stays Bikdushata, and Rabbi Dosa, the Tanya Shvuya, Chela Bitruma. A Shvuya who's married to a Kohen can continue to eat Truma even if she was raped. So now, or, or maybe even if she's a Bat Kohen, right, even if she's the daughter of a Kohen, she can continue to eat Truma, even though a Bat Kohen who's considered a Bula can't, okay, that would mess her up. If she were raped, she couldn't eat Truma anymore. We don't assume that a Shvuya is raped. So both of them say the same thing. They both basically assume she is not raped, Rabbi Yehuda for the knas issue, and right that she's a betula still, so she gets knas, and 
Rabbi Dosa for the Truma issue. I'm a Rabbi Dosa. Here Rabbi Dosa is going to explain. You might not like his language. But Bechima Asala Aravi Halaz, what did this Aravi man do to this woman? Bechim Ipnei Shami Echla Ben Dedeha, because he, he touched her between her breasts. Psalam in Akuna. In other words, maybe he touched her body, but it doesn't mean he raped her. Okay? We're not going to disqualify her from Kuna just because he touched her. Okay? Assumption that that didn't go on necessarily. They weren't raping women. So that's Rabbi Yochanan's approach, that according to Rabbi Yehuda and Rabbi Dosa, they both think that this woman wasn't really raped. That's the assumption. Next option. I'm a rabbi. Dilma Lohi. Maybe not, he says. I'm going to split between the two. These are two different issues. One is for the purposes of knas, and one is for the purposes of eating truma. Maybe you'll say that they don't each agree with each other. Maybe in the rape case, he said, listen, we don't want to let the rapist benefit by not having to pay knas. If we find some way to make him pay the knas, we're going to find it. Basically, he did something terrible. We don't want to exempt him from this payment. So therefore, if it's a chance, we don't know. Let's just say maybe she wasn't raped, in which case we're going to make that guy, the, you know, again, maybe she wasn't raped when she was a shvuya. Now she got raped. We're going to make the rapist pay for it. Elahatam. But when it comes to truma, we might not allow her to eat truma. Kirabana sphere. Maybe Rebuta holds like the rabbis that we're not going to allow her to eat truma. Okay, because there's no issue of lo yechotenis there. Inami, alternative, or from the flip side, you could also say, Rabbi Dosa could say, I don't even know like Rabbi Yuda. Rabbi Dosa could say, listen, when it comes to Truma, Truma is a rabbinic issue. Because Truma, again, we saw a whole machloket about it. Truma nowadays, many people hold is rabbinic only. So if Truma is rabbinic, ah, we'll be lenient, we'll let her eat Truma. But when it comes to knas, does he have to pay the knas? That's a Doraita issue. We're going to assume, yes, she could have been raped. And let's, gonna, let's exempt him from the payment of knas. So therefore, maybe they would disagree with Rabbi Yehuda in that case. Rabbi Dosa would disagree. Amalei Abai. So the first question we're going to have is on Rabbi. Abai says, wait a minute. You think he doesn't really believe that she wasn't raped. It's just he's going to say, we don't want, right? we don't know, let's say 50-50. So let's, we're not going to let this rapist get away without paying his knas. So we're going to make him pay. Well, Hatanya, there's a bright that says Rabbi Yehuda She stays in her sanctified state, meaning we assume she's not um, a non-virgin. She is a virgin. Even if she's 10 years old, why they say 10 is a good question, but let's leave it right now. Even if she's 10 years old, she still gets her full ketubah as a virgin. Now, Hatam Shaloye Niskal uh, there's no person who did something evil here. We're having a woman who goes to get married. She happened to have been a shvuya. She was taken into captivity. We don't know if she was raped or not. We're going to assume she wasn't and give her a full ksuba. What's our ulterior motive here? There's no, let's make him pay the knas because he was sinning. There's no such thing as that here. To which they answer, Here we do have an ulterior motive. What is it? Maybe he won't want to marry her because he'll say, oh, she was taken into captivity. Again, we're going to see how the rabbis go out of their way to say we don't want to, these women to be in vulnerable positions. If people know that they were taken into captivity and they'll think, the halacha says, we assume you're raped and your ketub is only 100, it's going to make her look less important in the eyes of a potential husband. Even though, on the one hand, he's paying less money. But he's not going to want to pay the less money. He wants the higher valued woman. So therefore, we're going to assume for those purposes, theoretically, Rabbi could say, again, this is Rabbi's interpretation of Rabbi Yehuda. The Rabbi Yehuda's whole approach is we want to protect the woman from and either. We don't want to, we want to penalize a rapist or we want to make sure this woman gets married. So we're going to say for all intents and purposes, even though we don't really know, we'll just assume she wasn't raped. But Rabbi Yochanan thinks no. Rabbi Yehuda really believes she wasn't raped. So now, Sava Rabbi Yehuda, Bikdushatai Kaima, according to Rabbi Yochanan now, does Rabbi Yehuda really hold that she's Bikdushata? That meaning, we're sure she's not raped? The Hatan, yeah, in other words, this isn't against, this isn't Rabbi, this is Rabbi Yochanan's interpretation of, of Rabbi Yehuda, that he and Rabbi Dosa both hold the same thing, right? We don't assume she was raped. 
But it says here in a bright time, we're going to have some trouble understanding this bright until we finally get to the end of today's half. We'll understand it fully. One who redeems a woman from captivity is allowed to marry her. Now, what we mean here is a Kohen. Because a Kohen can't marry a woman who was raped. So a Kohen who redeems a Shvuya is allowed to marry her. Meiba. And if the, now right now we're assuming the person who redeemed her testifies that nothing happened and I know for sure she wasn't raped, lo yisain, then he can't. Which doesn't really make any sense. Don't worry, we're going to ask about it in a second. Rabbi Yudah Omer ben kach ben kach leisena. Rabbi Yudah says it doesn't matter either which way, whether he was the one who, re, re, whether he redeemed her, or he redeemed her and testified about her, either which way, he can't marry her. To which the Gemara asks, wait a minute. Hagu fakasha, the first line makes no sense. Amarita bodea tashvuya yisena. First you said, if he redeems her, he can marry her. Vahadar tana, and then you said, me'iba lo yisena. If he testifies, he can't. Mishum de mei ba lo yisayin. I understand. If he redeemed her, he could. But if he redeemed her and then testified about her, he couldn't. That makes no sense. Just because he added testimonies, could it make it worse for him? Halo kashi. That's not a question. Hachi karma. This is the way it reads. Ha podet hashvuya umei ba yisayin. The first case is he redeems her and testifies about her, and then of course he can marry her. Umei ba kdi. But if he just testifies about her, he didn't redeem her. He just comes and testifies lo yisayin. He can't marry her. So. We still don't fully understand that opinion, but hold off, we'll get there. But we come up the because Rabbi Yudah said either which way, he's not believed. Meaning, we assume she was raped. How so? That goes against what we said Rabbi Yudah says. Amar Papa, so first answer is, Papa, Amar Rabbi Yudah Omer, Ben Kachu Ben Kachu Yisaena. Change it. Rabbi Yudah didn't say, Lo Yisaena, he said either which way he can marry her, because we don't assume she was raped. That's the first easy answer. Second answer, Rav Huna Barit Rav Yashu Omer, Lo Alam Kedikatani. Really, he says, Lo Yisaena. What does it mean, though? Rabbi They were talking according to the shita of the rabbis, meaning like this. Lididi, he says to them, according to me, ben kachu ben kachu yisena, I don't think she ever gets raped when she's in captivity. So I think he can marry her no matter what. But ela lidit chu, but according to you, ben kachu ben kachu lo yisena me Either which way you shouldn't marry her because the concern is maybe he's just trying to, right? maybe he's just trying to redeem her so he can marry her and he's not believed. In other words, whether he testifies about her or whether he just redeems her, either which way, he's suspect that he's doing this just because he wants to marry her. And he doesn't care if she was raped, but he's a Kohen and we can't allow him to marry a woman if she was raped. So again, Rabbi Yudah himself doesn't think it's a problem, but according to the rabbis, he's saying it should be a problem either which way. The Rabbanan will say to him, the rabbi's answer is, Why? We're going to distinguish between if he redeemed her or if he didn't redeem her. If he redeemed her, he put money where his mouth is, as we say. People don't just put money down for no reason. It must be he really knew, and therefore we believe him. He must have checked it out that she really wasn't raped, and therefore we believe him, because if he already put money down to redeem her, it must be he was serious about her, and it must be he must have checked. But But we're just worried if he just comes forward and testifies about her, he just fell in love with this woman, but it turns out she's a shvuya and there's concern she was raped. He might just lie and testify just to get out. Once he puts money down, we're assuming he's not going to lie. You can debate whether this is true or not. Again, so do Rabbi Yehuda and the rabbis, so there's room for debate. With that, we'll end today's staff. Have a great day, everybody. Meet up tomorrow.